Welcome everyone and thank you for attending today's webcast, Mastering Items and Bombs with Autodesk Belt Professional. Our presenter today is Forrest Judd. He is a solutions engineer with Hagerman & Company. Before we get started, I want to let you know that you're in listening only mode. If you have questions during the presentation, you can type them into the question panel on the right hand side of your screen and they'll be addressed at the end of the presentation. As we close down the session today, you'll be prompted to fill out a survey, and we do ask that you take a few moments to fill that out. Additionally, all registrants will receive a follow-up email containing a link for the recording of this presentation. And with that, I'll hand things over to Forrest. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, just a reminder, if you've got questions, um, everyone's in listen-only mode, so um, please feel free to type those questions into your uh, question panel on the GoToWebinar screen. I'll try to keep an eye on those as we go um, and address those questions that make sense in context with the presentation. Um, otherwise, I'll, be, I'll answer questions at the end. So this morning we're talking about um, items in Vault Professional. Uh, so we're going to start presuming that None of you know anything about items. We're going to start from the very beginning, describing what items are in Vault. Um, an overview of the item master itself in Vault. Um, how you go about creating items from your CAD documents. Uh, we'll discuss some additional item tasks. Um, move on to seeing how you create a complete engineering bill of materials, which is kind of the point of items in Vault Professional. Um, we'll go through an example of how you might manage the change process when it comes to items, including um, changes to, say, the inventor model that might impact, um, you know, the bill of materials. And then we'll finish up with uh, a quick look at how you might exchange information, um, bill of material information, with um, other business systems. So again, if you've got questions at any time, please feel free to type them into the question box. So items in Vault. Um, Vault items, it's a special record type. Um, those of you that are currently using Vault in some capacity today uh, are probably familiar with files in Vault. Um, file records, you know, they keep track of your CAD documents or other important engineering documents. Uh, you check those guys in and out, version history builds up, etc. Items are unique record types in Vault that have different behavior and serve a different purpose from the files. Items represent something that your company might make or buy. Um, so a part or an assembly, maybe some consumable like paint or grease, lubricant, etc. Um, these items may or may not be associated to files in your vault um, and they can carry their own properties. The purpose is, their, their fundamental purpose is so that you can um, generate the complete engineering bill of materials. So um, you've modeled an assembly, an inventor, let's say. You've got a bill of materials corresponding to those things that you've modeled, um, but you don't draw usually things like paint. <laughs> and so if you need to provide to someone else in the organization a more complete bill of materials, um, you somehow need to communicate to them, you need to buy this type of paint and here's how much we expect you're going to need. Um, your, your options in Inventor are really, well, we'll go over those in a little bit, but you have some options, but they can be kind of clunky. So that's where items kind of step in. Right? Items, they always participate in a life cycle. Um, unlike files in Vault Basic, for sure, they don't participate in the life cycle because Vault Basic doesn't understand life cycles. Um, but even if you're using something like Vault Workgroup or Professional already, you may or may not be using file-based life cycles. Items always participate in life cycle. They also always carry a revision level. Um, and the interesting things about these guys is if you tie them to a CAD document, say a CAD assembly, if you update that CAD assembly, you change quantity of parts in the in Inventor, or if you add components or remove components, um, the bill of materials on the item can update automatically to reflect those changes. So uh, while there is a bit of effort involved in managing the items in Vault Professional, 
um, it's a great way to flesh out a bill of materials that you need to deliver um, and then keep working in CAD and the relevant portions of the BOM related to the CAD model can update automatically in response to changes that you have to make in CAD anyway. So the item master in Vault Professional, that is the list of all of the items um, in your Vault. Um, you can think of it as a slightly separate environment within Vault Professional. Um, it looks a little different. Um, there are unique commands that apply to items. And in practice, this item master would be some subset of the information in your ERP or, or MRP item master. Likely not all of the properties associated with every part number you have, um, and likely not all of the parts that might be in your ERP. But those parts certainly that you have generated through modeling in CAD, but also you know, some collection of other parts that you need to use when building out your complete bill of materials. Now, to facilitate that, you can import data from another business system to build out those items that you might then need to attach to some other bill of materials somewhere. Right? Its purpose is to display information about the items, and the list is configurable, you know, just like any other list you know, you might see in Vault Pro. Um, it's basically what you use to interact with your items. Um, you can create new items um, using the item master. Items don't necessarily, again, don't necessarily have to be associated with a CAD document. Um, and that's where you get at the import and export commands. So let's take a quick look at the item master. So I have a relatively empty vault here. If I switch to the item master right now, in fact, I have only one item in the system. And this is an item that I have created um, that is not related to a CAD document. And so what you see, there's no organization in terms of folders or anything when it comes to the item master um, because this is intended to be a list. And over time, if you make use of items in Vault Pro, you may, in fact, um, end up with many hundreds or even thousands of items. Um, the idea is not that you go browsing through, you know, some structure of, of items to find what you're after like you might do with a file sometimes. Um, items and locating items, it's built around searching for things. So if I search for lubricants, it's going to return to me. that item, right? So you're, you're searching, you really want to be searching for items. Now, um, when you select an item in this pane here in the middle, um, much like when you're selecting files in Vault Explorer, um, you get some information about that item. So you see there are, so there are various tabs, and those tabs carry information about um, the item. So some general information, you'll see there's a bill of materials tab there. Um, some where used information, right? So much like you might see in a part file, for example, um, you know, you can see where it might be used. You get the same thing for items. So again, this can assist with things like impact analysis. Right. If we're going to make a change to an item, um, you know, what's going to, um, what impact is that going to have on the rest of my data set? Right. So when I open an item, I'm going to get access to all of those same tabs. And you can see this particular item is associated with, in this case, an MSDS sheet of this. 
items can carry their own set of properties, right? So this item project property is a is a custom property of this item. And there's also a history of these guys, right? So for example, if I just sort by this, for example, I could see um, in this case, I've made quite a few changes to this. Um, at some point, you know, I changed it to purchase. At some point in the past, I changed it to unit a measure. Um, notice here, unit items also have an explicit unit of measure assigned to them. So um, for our, you know, our CAD documents, most of them, unless it's like a shape cut to a certain length, most of them are units of each. And technically, in Inventor, you can manipulate the units of measure of um, of components. It's not trivial to do, and you're limited to only the units that Inventor inherently understands. Um, Vault Professional, you can create any unit of measure you would like, um, relate it to a standard unit of measure for conversion purposes, and then assign that unit of measure to the item appropriately. And that won't necessarily have any impact on the CAD document. Right? So, Again, the idea of these items are that you can assign bill of material information to manipulate that bill of material information, assign properties to these parts. They're really just parts that you buy or make. Assign the appropriate properties to those parts, part numbers that don't necessarily need to be associated with the CAD models, don't need to appear on a drawing, et cetera, um, and maintain those. And depending on the size of your organization and the people with their various responsibilities. Maybe some people are responsible for primarily manipulating items and they don't know so much about CAD, but they do the bills. They can work in this interface um, without necessarily having to go down to the CAD model and try to tweak something. Right? So it just provides a lot of possibilities um, when you're trying to manipulate bills, which is, you know, in my experience, was always one of the more painful parts of the process, right? Um, you would have the bill of materials from the model, but then, you know, you'd have to make sure for all your purchase items especially, you'd have to make sure that the part numbers were right. Um, if you're trying to deliver it upstream, you maybe you save it out to Excel and you start adding rows, um, typing things in, you know, the same you know, the, the same part number for the same paint I've used on the last five jobs, but I have to remember it or look it up somewhere, right? Um, the purpose of items in Vault Pro is to help you with that so it's not such a tedious task. Now, an interesting thing about these items as well, notice there's a padlock next to this item here on the left. That item is locked. It's in a release state. Um, there is a document associated with it, um, a nice thing about items is I can actually preview any of the documents related to this item right in a little window. So if I want to see the MSDS sheet for this lubricant, I don't have to op get a copy of it and open it or anything. It's in PDF form, so I can look at that right inside the vault. But in this case, this is released. We've verified maybe that the MSDS sheet is correct, that the property information is correct. We want to make sure someone doesn't necessarily update this um, out of turn. Um, the way my system is configured right now, the item controls the behavior of the file. And so the PDF document is locked, even though it doesn't have any sort of file lifecycle behavior that you might otherwise use to lock the file. Um, so you have the ability to control access to the related documents based on the state of the item that they're related to. And in fact, this item behavior, this was the original way in product stream, which was the prior and the name the name before we had Vault Professional. Um, items were really the only effective way to selectively control access to files. Um, the file lifecycle behavior and all of that came much later once Vault Work Group was introduced. So items are sort of the original way to manage both your CAD data and your bill of material data. Now if you use Inventor frequently or if you use 
you know, AutoCAD Mechanical with components, which is you know pretty rare, but there are people that do that. Um, AutoCAD Electrical is another example. Um, you can assign items to all of the parts in, say, an inventor assembly. We'll just stick with that example for now. Um, so you're not creating any of these items necessarily one at a time. Um, and Vault will capture the structure of the bill of materials um, based on the inventor bill of materials. That includes um, bill of material structure indicators like purchased or phantom. Um, a phantom component in the inventor bill of materials will not be assigned an item in Vault Pro because that's the point of phantom is that there shouldn't be a part number necessarily. It shouldn't show up in a parts list or a bomb. That's what the phantom bomb structure designator means. Right? Um, another, another interesting thing that especially has gotten improved in the absolute latest version of Vault, Vault Pro 2017, um, you can assign items to non-Autodesk CAD files. SolidWorks would be a good example. Um, if you have a mixed environment inventor and SolidWorks, there's a Vault add-in for SolidWorks. Um, Vault works with your SolidWorks files in almost exactly the same way as inventor files. You can do copy design. You can create items from them. There's an added in SolidWorks that lets you check files in and out, you know, properties map, the whole nine yards. So um, Vault is, they've made some improvements over the last couple of years to make it much easier to work with um, non-Autodesk CAD files, both from the standpoint of maybe using an add-in, but also the AnyCAD technology in Inventor, which allows you to directly reference non-CAD files in your models. Um, Vault can now check those files in along with your Inventor assembly. And if you then need to um, manage the bill of materials of that assembly, those CAD files can be assigned an item just like the other Autodesk files. <clears throat> um, now you can assign items to files one at a time, or you can pick an assembly um, and assign a whole bunch of items at once, or you could pick several assemblies and assign items you know, um, to all of them in one go. Um, every item has a number. Um, it generally corresponds to the file name um, that it's related to, but it doesn't have to. Um, every item number must be unique within Vault. Um, and we'll see this in a minute, but you have the opportunity, you know, when, say, creating an item from an assembly to manipulate its build materials a little bit um, as you're creating it, maybe modify some properties, et cetera. So let's take a look at how you might go about creating items from an assembly. So I have an inventor assembly here. It's just a little suspension. If you've ever looked at the uh, inventor sample files, you'll probably be familiar with this guy. And we can see it uses quite a few components. There's a fairly rich structure here. Right? Um, I've got sub-assembly within sub-assembly within sub-assembly. Um, and Vault can capture all of that structure um, including component quantity information when you're creating the items. So I can just right click here, assign item. That's where it reviews the inventor bill of materials and presents to me a new item dialog. Now I've yet to actually create this item. I've got an opportunity to maybe manipulate some information here. Right. But I can look at the bill of materials tab so it has captured this entire structure, including quantity information. So I know I've got eight of these. I've got two of these. Notice I'm allowed to edit these fields. So this is a way that you could potentially override the quantity if you need to maybe include some spare parts. So you only model what's supposed to be there when it's in operation. But if you need to include some spares, um, you know, you can always manipulate the quantity here. So you get quite a lot of feedback from this dialog. Um, notice all of this little icon is going to create all of these items for me in one go. Um, if this happens to be a purchased item, 
and I didn't necessarily um, tag it as such in Vault in, in Inventor. Um, you know, I could choose, for example, um, not to. I could turn rows on and off. I could choose not to create items for some of these subcomponents. So I don't necessarily care about these guys. I modeled them because I needed to see them in, in the Inventor model. But we're buying that shock, and so maybe I don't create those items. So I think for now we will, though. It wasn't initially tagged as purchased, so we'll leave it. Maybe we are going to make it. One other thing to notice here is I explicitly clicked on the assembly model to create this item. Notice I did have a drawing of this suspension, and Vault was smart enough to realize there was a direct parent drawing of that model, and it associated that with the item straight away. So now if I have a DWF of that drawing, I'll be able to view the drawing right in here in the item details dialog. Now notice another thing here, this work in progress mark. For items in Vault Professional, um, any DWFs associated with the related files, so in this case the suspension drawing, um, you can have it watermark that DWF anytime it's being viewed by something in the Vault environment, which would be the Vault Office client, the Vault Professional client, or the Vault Thin client. Um, they all could flag and watermark that DWF when you're looking at it. Right, so that the DWF isn't modified per se. It's the Vault UI that is splashing the um, the watermark across that page. So it's very clear that I probably shouldn't use this if I'm only supposed to be using, you know, released drawings. Right. So let's save this. It's going to be building out the items for me. And there we go. Now I have a populated item master. So again, you get effectively what's a big list. Um, notice the category list over here. Items have categories, much like um, your documents in Vault Workgroup might. Um, and it was smart enough to know that some of these were assemblies, some of them were parts, and some of them were, in fact, purchased items. So it categorized my document, my items, based on information from the files themselves. Right, so hopefully you can see it's pretty straightforward to build out items. Um, and now we've got a record type that can kind of behave on its own. Um, Maybe we can manipulate its bill of materials. It's going to be easier for us to communicate that bill of materials to other business systems, other groups within the company. Right? So once you've got your items created, there are various things you might need to do to an item. Um, you might need to edit it, right? change some properties, manipulate the bill of materials. Um, some notes about that. You can only edit one item at a time. You can be viewing the details for more than one item at once, but you can only edit one item at a time. And Vault, I'll show you in a minute, Vault will tell you what I, if you're editing an item, which one you're editing so you can maybe go to that item and, and finish edit mode. Um, also, if you're editing an item, no one else can edit that item while you're editing it. As soon as you go into edit mode of the item, it locks it for everyone else. Right. Um, the item must be in a read-write state. Um, and as we'll see in a little bit, um, the way Vault was originally designed with items, they were very closely tied to the change order functionality. So we'll be seeing a very little bit of that change order functionality later on. But it is possible to restrict modification of item data um, so that it can only take place when the item is controlled by a change order and through that change order interface. So it's a great way to make sure that your items don't get edited out of turn. You can also save items as other items. Um, one thing to note about that, file links are not maintained. So if I were to save as item of that suspension that I just created, 
save it as a new item, I would get its bill of materials um, just like it was, but it's not linked to the CAD file. So if I go and change the CAD file, my new item that I had saved as wouldn't update. You're effectively creating a, a snapshot of the bill of materials at that point. You could go back after the fact and modify it on that new item, but it would no longer be tied to the CAD file and be updated. Now another interesting thing about these items, they carry their own properties, but these properties can be related to the files. And so if you want to take a very item-centric approach to managing your information, you could actually have whatever pertinent property information needs to be associated to your parts could be stored on the item records themselves, and that property information could then be pushed back to the files. Right? Um, and it's important to note it's um, it is to the files themselves. You can't necessarily update a vault user-defined property directly from an item. Now, you could, I call it kind of round trip it, but basically you can update the item property, update the file property, which is in turn mapped to a vault user-defined property related to file records, and thereby get that UDP updated as well so that you can see it in Vault and Search, et cetera. But items, when it comes to, to interacting with property information, items interact with file properties. They don't necessarily interact with the user-defined Vault properties. There's a clear distinction there. Um, it's also interesting that item properties take precedence over any UDP mapping to file properties. So for example, I have a UDP, that user-defined property, let's say, um, that's related to file records, and I've got it mapped to a certain file property, and I've got an item property mapped to that same uh, file property. If I modify the user-defined property for the file record in Vault, and then I update the item property, um, let me rephrase that. If the item property has some value, I modify the user-defined property in Vault, thereby changing the file document. If I use the update item command, which we'll talk more about in a little bit, that's going to push that item property back to the file. So you do have to take some care in how you're arranging your properties and how they might be mapped to the files to make sure that what you need to be in charge of the property is actually in charge. And the way you typically modify that property via Vault is um, that your system is configured to enable that. Right? So if you want to modify your property information from, the, from Project Explorer, right? if you want to be able to grab a file or several files and edit properties, you need to make sure that your mapping is set up such that when you modify these properties, it can update the item in response. Depending on your mapping, you may need to modify the property on the item record instead. Right, so that's a uh, could be a little gotcha there. Um, if you do need to, if you change an item property and you want to force an update of the file property, you do need to use the synchronize properties command. Um, where this is really useful is if there's certain property information, say, come, that comes from ERP or MRP. Um, you can import that data and update the property information on the items and then synchronize properties on the related files, thereby getting the property information effectively from ERP pushed down to the file records themselves, which ultimately can end up landing on a drawing. So that's where that be can become very useful. Now another task if you're using items that you'll do with some frequency is the idea of updating items. Now an item is related to files, and we'll see an example of this in a minute, but an I a given version of an item, well let's say an item in general is related to a very specific version of a file. If that file version changes, 
the item does not automatically update to point to the latest version of the file. Um, and that's on purpose. That's the way it's always been. Um, because you may or may not want or need to update the item every single time the file version changes. If the file is undergoing a lot of work, it may be checked in and checked out several times. Eventually, once the CAD modeling is done and the file is pretty much ready to be released, at that point you can update the item information, synchronize it so that it's pointing to the latest version of the file, and then you know continue any item edits you might have. Um, the that's usually not an issue. Where it can become tricky is if you configure your system in such a way that you plan to use both file-based life cycles and item-based life cycles. Items are going to have life cycles regardless. Right? And the default behavior and best practice and really what should be done, your item state changes when you go from work in progress to review to release, you need to make sure the item is updated and pointing to the latest version of the file. Well, if you use file-based life cycles in Vault, when you change the state of a file in a file-based life cycle, that increments the version. Because Vault keeps track of the fact that it used to be work in progress and now it's in review. So the fact that your item needs to point to the latest version of the file before it transitions, that really restricts what your file lifecycle workflow can be. Because you need to make sure that by the time your item gets into a state where it's locked, because it's being reviewed and you want to make sure it doesn't change while it's being reviewed, you need to make sure that by the time the item gets to that point, the file lifecycle has completed entirely. Otherwise, you won't have the opportunity to update the item when the file revision changes or file version changes. So because of that potential conflict, it's general best practice if you're using items in Vault, you generally do not want to use file-based life cycles. There are cases where it does make sense, and I have implemented it that way myself a few times. Um, based mostly on you know customer requests and specific needs, but in general, your workflow is much easier if you do not use file-based life cycles with uh, with items. Now, in addition to creating items from your CAD documents using a sign item, you can always attach items to um, attach files to the items as well. And there are a few different uh, types of attachment. Well, there are two primary types, and then within the, within the first type, there are options. Let's put it that way. So we have file links, and we have file attachments. File link is a much more, uh, a much stronger association. So the primary file link to an item. So if we take a look at our suspension item, the CAD model, the CAD assembly, is the primary file link. What that means is that any property edits that happen to the item, if there's file write back enabled, those properties will get pushed back to the file. If the bill of materials of this assembly changes in Inventor, the bill of materials of the item will update to suit. Right? So it's a very close association. Right? Contrast that with the attachment of this MSDS sheet to this item that I created from scratch. In this case, this is just reference. Um, attachments are really intended to be reference information on the item, um, whereas links are intended to portray the digital representation of that item if it has, you know, shape or physical definition. Right. So, 
the, the primary link is the digital representation of what this thing looks like. The item is just information about the part number. So that's why we have the idea of this link. Um, so the file links, there are also, we have component and subcomponent. Um, this gets into the distinction of an inventor when you have um, virtual components. An inventor assembly might have 10 different virtual components created within it. Well, those are intended to be 10 different part numbers. In Vault, ultimately, you want those 10 different part numbers to be 10 different items because they have different part numbers, they have different properties, but there's only one document, the original inventor assembly, that stores the information on the CAD side. That's where you end up with a subcomponent relationship where you've got many many items that is, should be that should be reversed. It's a one to many, one file to many items. Um, Vault can account for that as well. So of these six types, I don't necessarily want to go into all the details. The design documents have this tertiary link status, um, and then Vault also understands the idea of standard content, so content center, inventor content center files. And the distinction there is properties are only read from that file during item assignment. Um, you then no longer update the item properties based on the document. So let's take a quick look at um, modifying, how we might go about modifying an item. So here's my suspension. Take, open this guy up and edit, and I have this item project property that I've designed to write back to the file. So maybe we had used this before. Maybe this is a new project number. Right? So I might want to modify that, but I also Maybe there's, a, there's another file I want to attach for reference. We had designed this suspension. We're, we're maybe relating this suspension to something that already existed somewhere. Um, I've got a picture of it in here. So I can browse through my vault or search. I'm just going to browse because I happen to know where it is. Um, there's just a, a JPEG in here. So I'm attaching that as an attachment. And on the View tab, that file is still going to be here. So I could view that JPEG right inside Vault when I'm looking at this item, right in Compare. So any file you want to attach for reference purposes can be attached. Let's make sure I modify this property. Save and exit. And now when I go to this file, if I want that project information to be written back to um, the assembly, I can quickly go to the file. There's quick links there to go back and forth between item to file, right? And when I synchronize properties, notice it, it updated the project file property. And because I have the file, the project file property mapped to my user-defined property of project involved, it's going to update here as well. So I could search for files now based on that project. Um, and the CAD document itself has its property updated as well. Now, in that this case, because I edited the properties, I have a new version of the file. When I go back to the item, we'll be able to see it still references version 4 of the assembly. Um, now, if I try to change the state of this assembly, um, I should get an error because it's not up to date. So I will have to update. Now it's going to reference version 5. Save it, and I'll be able to change the state. So we'll go ahead now and just release this for the next part of the presentation. And I'm just going to grab um, everything related to this assembly 
and let's see if it'll let us release it all in one go. All right, so now our assembly is released. Now, um, the whole point of, of this exercise really is to um, flesh out bills and materials. Why do we even go through this? It is extra steps, right? We're now, we have an extra record to deal with. Um, it's because this lets us flesh out our bill of material um, in, in an easier way, right? The way a lot of people build out their engineering BOM or EBOM now is they might create virtual components in Inventor. Um, they might manually modify their drawing parts list. Um, and then that parts list maybe gets exported or worst case, someone gets a copy of the drawing and puts all of these part numbers into ERP. And sometimes they type a number wrong and you know things happen. Um, Maybe you export it to Excel and modify, right? Maybe you have an ERP system or an MRP system or a PLM system that manages your bombs. Um, maybe you have to, may, you know, in a best case, in the absence of both, you know, maybe you export from the inventor bill of material dialog, import it into your business system, but you still then have the task of, in that other system, fleshing out the bill. And I don't know that I've met a single person that likes their ERP system. <laughs> I've never talked to anyone that says, oh, I, it's great, I love it, I work in it all day long. Um, I've never met that person. So um, if you're comfortable with Vault, if you're comfortable you know, with Inventor, um, why, not, you know, why not use Vault to do this? Right? So if you're using virtual components, you know, the problems with that, you've got to create them every time they appear in an assembly. It's repetitive. You have to remember the part numbers and the property information that's associated with them. If it's a virtual component that needs some sort of assembly structure, you can pretty much forget about it. Um, you know, the parts list, again, it's repetitive. It's prone to mistakes. Um, exporting to Excel, managing multi-level bombs in Excel is, is quite difficult in my experience. Um, you've got to know the part numbers and information for the parts you're working with. Um, and if you're going to do it in ERP or MRP, the big downside of that is you have to use that software to do it. And some of them are surprisingly hard to use considering what they're supposed to do. So vault professional items can help with that. right? Again, it's easy to create them from the CAD documents. It's easy to manage your multi-level bills. You don't ever have to leave your vault and CAD environment. You know, you're working in the tool all day. You just switch over to items, flesh out your bomb, and go about your business. Right? Um, a big one is that the bombs can be updated automatically based on the model changes. Right? Um, and if you've got to flesh out that bomb, rather than retyping in the part numbers that you need, that you think you need, those part numbers are in vault, so you search for them use the property information associated with them to verify that you've got the right component and just add it to the bill. So these bomb management tasks, you know, you may need to add or remove rows, you know, add line items, take things away, um, turn rows on or off, um, change position or quantities. Um, you can edit some properties via the bomb interface, right? Um, but then changing items, especially revising them, um, because you, if you're using items in Pro, and we're kind of segueing into another topic here um, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to show kind of the whole, the whole change process and bomb management here together in just a minute, right? Um, I want to explain a little bit about managing item changes because one of the most effective ways to manage items in Vault is to use the change order functionality in conjunction with items. And that's how this was originally designed to work. ECOs are now optional, but, op but ultimately still pretty useful. Um, and there are specific bits of functionality when it comes to change orders that only apply to items. Um, a big one is link properties. Um, 
for every item on a change order, you can have a distinct property. So a really common one is disposition. If you're changing a bill of materials, you may be adding a new component, you may be reworking an existing component or scrapping something. You can keep track of that kind of information on a per item basis for every specific ECO. It's a great bit of functionality for communication purposes. So let's take a quick look at how you might go about you know, the overall change process um, in Vault Pro. So we have a task before us. Um, we need to manipulate one of the components in this assembly. Now I've made just a quick tweak to my Ed Vault administration so that I cannot simply put this item into a work in progress state. Um, I've told the system that I want to require the use of an ECO. Right? So what we really need to do is there's a little there's a little arm at the bottom of this guy. And I don't have my property information thoroughly filled out, so I can't necessarily search on it. It's this guy right here. So it's item number 47. So I'm just going to get a quick shortcut to that guy, too. Um, I know we want to change this little bar. Um, and, of course, our overall assembly is going to change. I'm going to add these guys to a new change order. Right? So my assembly and that bar, and this is where my disposition, well, we're going to we're probably going to replace this because maybe we use that bar in a couple different places. For this, new, for this particular assembly, we're just going to add, we're going to make a new component here. So we're reworking the assembly. We're replacing this component. Right? Um, again, this is the change order functionality. You can provide descriptions. There are due dates. This is a bit out of the scope of today's presentation, but just to give you a little, a little taste of it. Um, and then all of the documents that I had associated with all of those items are available on the Files tab of the change order so that I could, for example, mark up right within the system to indicate the change that I want to make. All right, so here we want to remove some material here. I can save this markup back to the system. So this is our markup. And another nice thing about the change order functionality is that you receive email notifications um, when you've got something to do. All right, so, for example, something that I was doing earlier this morning, I got an email from the system saying, you know, in this case, this change order was closed. And it has links to all of the various, you know, objects impacted to the change order so I could quickly get right to those things inside my vault client. So the change order functionality provides email notification. So I'm going to submit this to my open state of the ECO. And now that I've got this controlled with a change order, one thing to note is you've got a change order history here for everything that you have. Uh, so you can see every change order that's ever impacted this particular item. It's also a convenient way to get to the change order. And now I should be able to change the state of these guys to web so that I could do some work. Notice they also automatically implemented to RevB. So here's my assembly. Notice now the padlock is gone because the item is work in progress. I'm going to open this guy up in Inventor. This may take just a minute. I was having some issues earlier this morning with files taking a long time to open, but I guess that has since been resolved. So here's our suspension. Um, you know, we've got here's that bar. Here is the assembly. Um, we're going to be modifying the bar. So I'm actually just going to do a save and replace component on this guy.
So let's see. We'll give him a new lower bar. I was expecting some file name, file naming assistance there, but it didn't happen. So, so we've got a new component in the assembly. Where I can make my change. We'll just make it real quick here in the interest of time because we're nearly to the top of the hour. Just cut a little chunk out of there. Right? So we're maybe we're doing this to reduce weight. One second here. I need to turn off and add in. This is the data standard, by the way. I was not intending to show this, so let's turn this off for a moment, see if we can get this saved. Right, so now we're going to check this back in with our new component. And now back in Vault, if we go to our item, we can update our assembly. When we look at our bill of materials, now we have our new lower bar. It's going to automatically create this new item for us. And the other item is, is gone from the bill. It's disappeared. So the bill has updated in response to our inventor model changes. So now we should probably add that lower bar onto our change order. And this guy is the new piece, right? So now we've got a new, we know we've got a new part. We're replacing an existing one. We're reworking the assembly itself. And we'll just go ahead and fast track this to approved in the interest of time. Now, these guys, generally I would have put them back into the review state um, before doing this, going through the normal way so that they get locked and that things aren't changing while you're trying to modify it. Um, but my life cycle allows me to um, go straight to release, so it shouldn't be a problem. Well, I can probably just change the state right here to review. But then when I, there we go. So now when I cl close this change order, it's going to ask me for the final state of these items. So this is a really nice feature, um, because this lets the items sit there in review while the ECO is going through the rest of its paces. And then when it's all said and done, you say they should be released. And now our items are released. We're at Rev B of our suspension with newly updated, newly updated bar. And the task is complete. So that's very quickly how you would go about managing a bill of materials when the underlying model might change. You notice I really had to do very little to make the bill of materials accurate. And in fact, if I want to see what has happened, we can actually compare this bill of materials between Rev A and Rev B. That's another really nice feature of managing the bombs in Vault Pro is you can do some um, comparison between different rev revisions or versions of the bomb. Right. So the last little bit topic here, it's more just informational. There's not a lot to this. It's a pretty easy task. Um, oh, this finally came up, so let's take a quick look here. I can compare this with Rev A released. 
and notice we've got a red line here. 47 disappeared, right? Row A exists in revision A version 4, but not in revision B. So we can see between A and B, we added the new lower bar and we removed this part. So it's pretty straightforward to see. Everything else looks good. So right? that comparison can be very handy, especially if you've got a large complex bomb. Right? And you can search within this bomb too. If you end up with you know hundreds and hundreds of parts in your bomb, you can search the, the bomb here to find what you're after to see what maybe has changed. Right, so the last topic here is communication, right, because it's all well and good that you've got this bomb in Vault Pro, but that's not where the bomb ultimately needs to be. Um, in most organizations, you have an ERP system, an MRP system, maybe a PLM system that the rest of the company might use to manage the bomb, to buy things, et cetera. Right? Um, and you need an efficient way to get this data into that system. Now, Vault does not include any sort of automated ERP communication um, out of the box. And it does not include traditional ERP or meet functionality. It's not meant to serve as an ERP system. It doesn't track supplier information and the quotes you've gotten for certain products and inventory or routing through the shop. It doesn't do those kind of things, right? It's really an engineering tool that has some feelers out to the rest of the company. Right? Um, but it is straightforward to get items in and out via import and export, right? It is possible to make automated or semi-automated communication using the Vault API. I have done that for some customers in the past. Um, generally, it comes down to do you really want that and how much value is there involved. In that case, you might create a custom solution to automatically transfer the data. Right? Um, but it's very straightforward. Um, if I want to get this bill of materials to some other system, I could just select it and export items. It knows what the structure is. I can choose various formats to export and a way to communicate the structure. Between these two options, most systems could understand the structure. Um, give it a file name. And then you can choose exactly what columns, or what properties from Vault end up in your export. Um, normally, it would be just a few, sometimes just um, you know, parent, in this case, like the, the item number or the part number and the quantity, and then maybe a description so you can make sure you understand what part is what. Just like that, we have our export. Right, we just open this guy up in Excel, see all the, the columns. And most modern ERP or MRP systems could just import this straight away and your bill is there and you don't have to touch it very much. Or you just send this file to somebody and they could do the work because who wants to work in ERP? Uh, I, don't, I do not, that's for sure. And last thing here, if you've got items that exist in your ERP system but you never intend to draw them, but you need to reference them on your bills of material to make your complete EBOM, you know, we can import data as well. Right, and I've already set up a mapping here. This is going to create, I can also update item information here if need be. And now I have a host of new items in my vault, including one of, of these guys ha does have a bill of materials. All right, and we are just at the top of the hour, so that's uh, what I had to discuss today. Now, uh, I haven't seen any questions come in yet, so um, now is the time. If you've got any questions about item functionality, um, any of the things you've seen here today, or really any questions about Vault in general, please feel free to type them into the question pane now, and I'll do my best to address them.
Right. I still don't see any questions, so I think maybe we'll go ahead and wrap it up then. Okay, thanks, Forrest. Um, if you do think of additional questions, you can simply reply to that confirmation email you received from GoToWebinar, and we can get those to Forrest to have your questions answered. Um, and once again, if you could take a few moments to fill out the survey, we would appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.